get started. My name is Jeff Tips. I am a principal software engineer for the aerospace business unit. We've been working for, uh, with NI for 16 years. And what we're gonna talk about today is a reference architecture that came out of the Aerospace BU last year. I'm gonna talk about some of the capabilities of this architecture, what it can do, what it's intended to solve. Um, also, we're gonna talk about some of the design decisions that went into the architecture. But I think more, interesting, more, more interestingly, we're gonna talk about some of the design methodologies that we employed in making this design um, and uh, some you know, kind of our experiences with it. So this is how we're gonna break it down. First, we're gonna talk about the application space that this was initially targeted for. We're gonna talk about the problem that this architecture is intended to solve. We're gonna talk about um, uh, MBSE. So we dabbled in model-based systems engineering. This is where the methodologies came from to, uh, to design and implement this architecture. So we're gonna go through, uh, I'm gonna share those experiences with you. Uh, we'll talk about the hardware architecture, the software that's used on this thing, how we validated the architecture, and what deliverables came out of this project. Um, and in case anybody is curious, the system that came out of this architecture is downstairs. It's the big two rack, 2000 channel strain gauge system with the airplane wing that's bending. That was the uh, system that was designed out of this architecture. So you can go downstairs and see it working uh, uh, for yourself. So let me start by saying that uh, initially when we were scoping out this project, we were looking at uh, this market space, which we affectionately maybe incorrectly call static structural test. This is a, a type of test characterized basically by lots of channels, but fairly low sample rates. So typically 100 samples a second, anything under one kilosamples a second, it's that kind of region. There is no output on the system. There's no simulation on this system. This is simply monitoring. It is acquiring large amounts of data and then offline you take that data, compare it to whatever you are expecting to refine your models or your DUT. So it is uh, that segment of test is what we were trying to attack with this architecture. So here's some example tests that, that we wanted to satisfy. Um, they're common in channel types like lots, lots of strain gauge, voltages, pressures, thermocouples, but you can see a wide range of channel, uh, channel counts and those channel compositions can change from test to test. So you can see we could have tests from anywhere from like 100 channels to hundreds of channels, even up to 2000 channels. And it's the system we have downstairs is a 2000 channel system. So we need to come up with an architecture that solves all aspects of this market. We can't go out with just a recipe for a 2000 channel system because there's just frankly not enough business there to justify that kind of thing. It's got to apply to a wide spectrum of same type test. In addition to the channel types, which are common amongst these uh, types of tests, there's also functionality within the test system that's common. So um, uh, uh, typically you, know, you want to see you can correlate the data across the entire structure. Uh, these tests are expensive to run. You can't rerun them. So this test system itself needs to be fault tolerant. Um, uh, when you start getting larger structures, there's pressure to distribute the, uh, you know, cabling becomes an issue. And so there's more pressure to distribute the instrumentation across the structure. And um, we need more than one pair of eyes on the test. So we've seen that as a common requirement. You gotta have a team of subject matter experts who have eyes on the test, maybe different subsets of the structure to make sure the test is going well. So what problem are we trying to tackle with this architecture? So if you are, are uh, somebody who's trying to solve an application like this or something similar to this, um, you, uh, and you go to ni.com and you look at our product catalog, I mean, there are lots of options. And options are good. Uh, and it can be kind of overwhelming to look at all the different ways that you could solve this problem with our product line. Uh, so just at the very beginning, you've got PXI and you've got C-Series. PXI and C-Series have similar capabilities and channel type coverage, but not identical. There are differences between the two. How are you supposed to choose? And then let's say you do choose, let's say you go through and you do, there is differences in cost, environmental specs, uh, channel density, uh, measurement uh, performance. And let's say you go through that exercise and say, yeah, I wanna do a, a C series and not just, you know, well, not field deck, not compact Rio, let's do a C DAC application. Let's say you get that far. Well, how are you gonna synchronize all of the data on your C DAC uh, system? There are options there. You could do something that does more time-based routing and triggering routing like the 9469 does, or you can do something more time-based like TSN. 
Let's say you make that decision. Even within CDAC TSN, there's a lot of different ways you can wire up the system. Um, and in fact, we tried a lot of different ways and we'll show you the different uh, topologies that we experimented with. But you could do um, daisy chain, you could do a star topology, you could do a ring topology. And let's say you go through all of that, then you still have software decisions to make. You can write your own thing. We have FlexLogger, something you'll find in our catalog. Our partners have fine, uh, fine offerings as well that could work. So it's just like huge, this, this big choose your own adventure thing, right? And uh, I have gone through this choose your own adventure with many customers in the past, and it always comes down to this like question at the end, which, which is how well is this going to work? How many channels can this work with? How fast a sample rates can I expect? And so this is a fundamentally what we're trying to tackle with this architecture is, is to give, uh, it's an exercise in confidence at the end of the day. We want to give you confidence that what you're going to buy and assemble from NI is going to work. NI wants the confidence that what we're selling you is going to work. Our support organization wants similar confidence. Um, our, our, I mean, this is really what this is all about is to, to give you evidence that NI can satisfy tests of this size. So we did, um, uh, so now we wanted to like define what is this system, what is its scope, what is it gonna accomplish? So this, kind of, this became a requirements development and gathering exercise. Uh, we did dabble in model-based systems engineering to, uh, uh, to, to implement this, this system. So before we go much further, let me go ahead and define what I mean by model-based systems engineering. Uh, I think a lot of people use this uh, term maybe slightly differently. Um, when I say model-based systems engineering, what I mean is performing the discipline of systems engineering with a modeling tool. That's what I mean by that. So uh, the opposite of model-based systems engineering is document-based systems engineering. And this is your, your typical, you've got your chief engineer or your engineer sitting down, making design decisions, capturing those decisions in a, in a requirements document or a feature spec or a test plan. You have all these different documents and the sum of those documents Really, the sum of those documents in that chief engineer's brain is the system definition. And this works perfectly fine for, for many, many projects. The challenge is if you get to projects of su sufficient size and complexity, it is very challenging to keep all of these documents in sync and in an agreement with one another. We didn't even have that much, like the, our project is not that complicated. I mean, we, uh, we're not building an airplane or a, or a rocket or a missile. And still, I was drowning in the amount of documentation that was out there for this project. And it was not only incomplete and inconsistent, but they were often contradictory to one another. And so I'd be sitting in a room full of product owners and business owners and engineers, and we would have five different people and five different ideas of what this system even was and what it did. So we dabbled with model-based systems engineering to try to solve that problem. Model-based systems engineering as an alternative, you have the same engineer making the same design decisions, but instead of putting this stuff in documents, you capture all these design decisions in a modeling tool. The system definition uh, is then um, captured within this tool, all the behavioral requirements, structural aspects, every design decision is supposed to be captured in this tool. The reality is this tool is better at capturing some decisions than others. That's the, that's, that was our experience, but that's the idea. And then the, the documents still exist, but the documents are scripted out of the tool. And we did dabble in this. Like if you go into our internal wiki, our, our uh, R&D wiki for this project, we have requirements document, we have a test plan, we have design document, none of them are handwritten. Those are all scripted out of the modeling tool with information we captured in the model. And I thought that was kind of cool. I thought that was a win. Like uh, whenever the model was, was version in Git and whenever we merged our branch into master, we would trigger this, uh, we would have a, pi a pipeline action that would rescript out all of our documentation and put it into uh, our wiki repo and then make pull requests against that new documentation for review from um, all the stakeholders. It automated the, the document maintenance part of the project. And you know, I, I'll, I'll call that part of this project a win. That th I thought that part worked fairly well. So a little bit more about MBSC. Every piece of literature I've read about MBSC talks about the three pillars, the language, the tool, the methodology. There are uh, options for all three of these pillars. I can tell you what we picked in this project was SysML for our language, Cameo Systems Modeler for our tool, and MBSC Grid for our methodology. 
SysML, um, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, it has roots in UML, and it was, uh, uh, it's mostly UML with some extra stuff in there for system definition, but it's a, it is a, a, a standard language, it's a graphical language, it's a diagramming language, and so, you would think with NI, with LabVIEW, we'd be kindred spirits here, uh, but it's a lot like that. It is a standard way to document the requirements, structure, behavior, and parameters of your test system. Um, this was honestly the hardest part about adopting MBSC for my team was learning this new language. We bought books, we took training. I eventually um, achieved, uh, went and pursued a, a professional certification in SysML, but this was a journey. And, um, and honestly, uh, if you talk about lessons learned, this whole effort is about as effective as everybody is in learning this language. And, and this is not a super easy language to learn. But um, we did try to climb this, uh, it's, it's a learning curve and we did try to climb it. And, um, and it is the foundation from which all of this other stuff flows. Uh, Cameo System Modeler is made by No Magic. They were later bought by Dassault. Um, it's a little clunky thing to use, but it was, it, it, um, it is a, a way to, to make SysML diagrams where all the elements are linked with one another. But finally, you have the methodology. And this was probably the most important part of the entire process. Because even if you have SysML, and even if you had the world's best modeling tool, it doesn't tell you when to make what diagrams and how they should link together. And this is where the methodology really steps in. So the methodology that we used was called MBSC Grid. This is actually a white paper on this available for free. Just search MBSC Grid and you'll see this, uh, this picture pretty quickly. And there's a whole white paper that introduces the concept. But every cell, the basic idea here is that every cell on this grid is a different type of SysML diagram. SysML diagrams are broken up actually into four categories. And so all your behavior diagrams will show up here, all your structure diagrams will show up here and et cetera. But the grid suggests a logical order for which you break down the problem. And so if you wanna talk about lessons learned, one of the lessons learned that uh, my team captured at the end of this was this methodology was the most useful part of the project, even if we didn't use SysML or a modeling tool. Like even if we use ch chicken scratch on a napkin, going through the problem in this prescribed way was beneficial to my team and my business owners. Um, but the basic idea here is you start with the stakeholder needs. And I'll say that that slide that I showed you about, it needs to have channels, there's more than one set of eyes, like very vague kind of problem statement-ish things serve as good stakeholder needs to begin the decom decom decomposition process. So you start with these stakeholder needs and um, uh, the temptation is you have this list that isn't, uh, it isn't, Super specific, it's not verifiable with a test, so let's now iterate on these needs and create system requirements. The methodology advises against this. The methodology says, don't do this. In fact, we did do this <laughs> first, and we had that set of system requirements, and it was interesting to go back and look at them later. But the methodology encourages you not to go from stakeholder needs to system requirements, but instead, to go to the right and start capturing all of this information, then your system requirements are born out of those uh, six diagrams that you make there on the right. It is criminal how little time I have to like devote to this topic, but I will share one example, um, which I hope demonstrates what, what I'm trying to talk about here. So the, uh, the, the methodology does suggest that after stakeholder needs, you jump over here and do your system context. So a system context, let's define that term, is an operating environment and all its external elements that interact with the system. So for instance, we have an operate, we have a situation here where the test system will be, uh, uh oh, no one do that. Where the, uh, where the test system will be interacting with, with test sensors and these people and you have this information flowing between it, this is what's called a context diagram. We have six of these for structural test. When I was trained on this, the example that was shared with me was a cruise missile with two different contexts, cruise missile on the platform, cruise missile in the air. And the idea is the cruise missile in these two different situations have uh, different actors, hopefully, right? And you have different behaviors that's expected out of the system. And so the first question we need to ask ourselves are what are all the different situations that our system is gonna find itself in? Who are the actors who are gonna be interacting with that system? That's step one. Now, if you're like me, I would look at something like this and I would think, this is obvious. Why are we wasting our time making a diagram that is so simple and obvious? 
But I can tell you, uh, we went through this process in two different projects in the most contentious part of the system definition in both those projects, we're making these diagrams right here. And, and what I discovered is that people in their head, they just have different ideas of what's in the system and what's external to the system. And by going through and making these diagrams, you're forcing yourself to harden what's called the system boundaries. Basically what's inside your system is something that's gonna be delivered as part of this project. What's outside the system has been identified as a dependency. And it turned out, at least for me in the projects I'm working on, this turned out to be pretty contentious conversations and really important conversations to have early on because that it's all about your scope, right? So um, that's one benefit of sitting down and taking the time to do this is it hardens your system boundaries, what's in and what's out. Your calibrator, would you call that part of your system or is that something else? Is that a dependency? Those kind of conversations we found to be pretty rich. Also, as a side effect of this, any external element interacting with your system becomes, in SysML, this is a proxy port. In reality, it's an interface. And so it helps you identify early on what are all the interfaces to our system that we need to be thinking about. And then finally, it helps you identify all the external actors, either machine or human, that are going to be interacting with your system, trying to extract or harvest some value out of your system. So these are pretty important questions that you should be like thinking about whether you're doing it here or not. Yeah, what are, what's in your system? Who's going to be interacting with it? And what do they want to accomplish with it? Um, system context diagrams really uh, hone in on those concepts early on. Now, I don't have a... Uh, a slide for it, but the next step is to do use case diagrams where you basically go through each context and actor and say, what is that goal that this external actor is trying to accomplish? When an engineer walks in and sits in front of your system, what is he or she trying to do? Um, uh, you go through that for every external actor interacting with your system. Then the methodology suggests that for every one of those goals, for every one of those items of value that your external actor is trying to harvest from your system, you go through and make a narrative. Okay, so you have an engineer who wants to sit down and validate the test system before test. Let's walk through that. Let's make uh, so I've heard also this called a workflow. Let's, let's, let's like capture the narrative for the interactions between this actor and the test system. So this is a SysML diagram, it's called an activity diagram. And these are called swim lanes that run up and down. And then you have uh, each swim line is assigned an element from your model. So that same block that was used in the context diagram, it's assigned right here to the swim lane. And now you just start going through and you start making this, uh, you make, start making this narrative. You can do this in text if you want, or you could do this in SysML. So we're gonna wait for some signal from the test uh, director. We're gonna do something, we don't know what, but he's gonna do something to arm the test. Then the system is gonna do something to arm itself. Some feedback information is gonna go back to the uh, external actor, and they're gonna make some decisions and move on and move forward. We made like 24 of these diagrams for the structural test offering. So what happens is, as you go through and start building out these diagrams, you start seeing these, uh, these rounded rectangles that are allocated to the test system. These rounded rectangles are called uh, activities, I think, in SysML. They're basically functions that your system must perform. It's starting to smell a lot like a functional requirement. And indeed, uh, that's, that's how we treated these things. So you now have a behavior, part of a workflow, attached to a use case in a context, and there is a traceable relationship, because this is done in a modeling tool, between this element and this element, the test system and this behavior. So what you can do is ask the modeling tool, Mr. Modeling Tool, can you please aggregate all of the behaviors that we have ever allocated to the test system? And I'll put them on this grid here at the very top. So here's an, this is something that a tool can do, it's a computer, it's really good at this kind of thing. So then what we chose to do is just go down the list. You don't have to do it like this, we did it like this. Go down the list and we're like, all right, for every one of these things, let's go ahead and right click, create a new modeling requirement element. Let's, uh, let's check the box here to say that this textual requirement refines this behavior from our model. And then let's get out our keyboard and start typing. Now I'm not going to pretend like this is the best requirement ever written. But what you do have is a requirement, a system requirement, with a traceable relationship to an activity diagram, with traceable relationships to both goals and context, 
with traceable relationships back to a stakeholder need. So it stands to reason that this system requirement that you just wrote should satisfy one or more stakeholder need, right? I mean, it's, it should happen. And so that's one thing that the tool does allow you to do. And I'm just like, I'm just touching. In fact, my team, honestly, just barely touched the surface of this. But this is an example of how you can use a modeling tool to perform an analysis. So you could take, I hope everybody can see this, but you can make a, a grid similar to the one I just showed. And across the top, you put all the stakeholder needs. And then across to the side here, you put all your requirements. And you go through and say, all right, we got this requirement. What stakeholder need does it satisfy? Go through that exercise with your chief engineers, with your business owners, with your developers. And this, this turned out to be one of the richer conversations for us because it now allowed us to analyze how well do these system requirements meet the need? What we found the first time we did this was we had stakeholder needs up here without a single requirement uh, assigned to it. So that is a sign that we have not, there are whole areas of this project we have not thought through yet. Subsequently, we had requirements on here that we could not honestly attach to a stakeholder need. And I'm happy to report that we actually removed requirements from the project as a result of this analysis. So I thought that was a win. But furthermore, you can extract this same kind of idea. You have traceable relationships between all these aspects of your system. You can perform all kinds of analysis with this. Um, another one, which I'm not gonna be able to touch on, is you're supposed to put your, your design in the modeling tool. And in fact, the modeling tool supports multiple designs per project. So you can have a, a single like problem statement, like all those problem diagrams that I showed you before, and you can have multiple designs linked to it, and it's, you're supposed to be able to do like a trade-off analysis with that. We didn't dive too much too deep into that, but that's the kind of thing is you can do a similar analysis between your design to the requirements. Um, this is a, when I talk to customers about MBSC, this is the part that, is, that they get the most excited about is uh, you can anticipate the uh, impact of change on your system. So for instance, if a requirement changes, what are all the, the workflows that are affected? What are all the logical subsystems that are affected? And what are all the components that are affected by this requirement change? And subsequently, you can do it the other way around. Let's say some new constraint appears, like a component constraint. What requirement, well, everything up the chain. What is, uh, uh, what, ultimately, what is the impact of the, uh, the component change in this system? So this is the promise of MBSC. We did more of this, I mean, we did, I would say, more of this stuff than we did of this stuff. Um, for, uh, uh, I was kind of disappointed to report that as this project went on, our model got stale. And I can tell, I, I, I think I know why that happened, but we were really good about, and very disciplined about modeling, uh, using the modeling tool early in the project, and we lost that discipline later on in the project. Um, we started using other tools to, like, to manage the project, and so the model got stale. Um, and that's the whole point of this whole thing, is having a single source of truth. And when you lose the single source of truth, it gets very difficult to keep things in sync. Um, so there you go. So a uh, little taste there of model-based systems engineering, the way we applied model-based systems engineering, the tool we used, a little taste in the methodology there. If you're interested in learning more, I've got resources. Like I said, we read books, we took training. There's some stuff out there, free and paid, that you can look at. Um, but uh, yeah, a little bit of our experience. Now let's actually talk about the architecture itself and what we ended up delivering. So. Um, uh, if you go and download the, uh, uh, the documentation for this architecture, this is one of the first diagrams that you're going to see. Now, what I want to point out on this diagram is the multiplicity on it. So you have uh, one to n rings, one to n nodes, an n to one aggregation subsystem, and uh, I think that's it. So. Like I said earlier, we want to deliver on something that, would, it's, that could uh, instantiate a 100-channel test system all the way up to a 2,000-channel test system. And so the, the multiplicity you see on this diagram is intended to satisfy just that. This is a pattern. It's, more, it's not really a recipe of how you cook a very specific cake. It's a pattern from where you could maybe make lots of different types of cakes from it. That was the idea. So... Um, before I unpack this a little bit more, I want to just define a few terms here. So when I say a node, what I mean is a TSN-enabled CDAC chassis. And that would include field DAC. The internals are very similar. A TSN-enabled CDAC chassis is what, I'll, what I'm meaning when I say node. When I say a ring, what I mean is the way these nodes are hooked up. 
So you can see this is not a daisy chain or star topology. This is a ring topology. We, we make a daisy chain, but both ends of this daisy chain are connected to a switch. And that's what I mean by ring. Um, these uh, switches over here, these are C-Rio 9805s. I don't know why we call them C-Rio 9805s because they don't look like C-Rios, they don't plug into a C-Rio chassis, but they are a TSN enabled switch, a four port TSN enabled switch that, that we offer. Um, and then on our server subsystem, we use FlexLogger. All right, so let's talk about the uh, scaling up this system. So you, uh, we talked about a single ring. So you have a single ring, both ends connect to the C-Rio 9805. If we wanted to add a second ring, well, we have this extra port here. We can take the output from this stage, plug it into this stage, and now we have a two ring aggregation design. If we wanted to add a third ring, well, you just add a third, uh, third switch here, and the two outputs go to that third switch, and you do a similar thing. Pretty easy, right? We want to add a fourth ring. You could do something similar, or you could take a, basically two of these pairs and tuck them in parallel to each other and minimize the number of hops that are going out to your server. And a six ring configuration would be something like this. So this is, a, uh, this is what I mean by a pattern. Like there's not a set number of switches and you wire them exactly like this. This is intended to be able to scale from dozens to thousands of channels with this pattern. And so what we did, Again, in the, valid, in the spirit of validation is we took a design on the extreme end of size and complexity and we built that system and it looks, uh, it's, not, it's not six rings, but it is five rings. And that's what is the system that we have downstairs. All right, so we're talking about rings. Rings are here for, uh, for redundancy. Um, so here is a schematic of the system that you'll see downstairs. How well did we do in building redundancy into this system? Give me a grade. Not very good. No. Not very good. <laughs> there are several single points of failure in here. Um, uh, I'm happy to report that there is some, uh, there, there's the, some of the redundancy in here works, I think works well. So the ring part of this, so everything here on the right are single points of failure. Fully recognize that. The stuff on the left, um, uh, the ring part of this actually worked pretty good. So while you have the 2000 channel system running, if you walk up to it, and unplug like this wire right here, what you'll see in FlexLogger is you will lose synchronization to the chassis local to this chassis here, but you won't lose any data. You don't lose a single data point. It continues taking that data, but it takes about 30 to 90 seconds for the TSN network to reconfigure itself and establish system-wide configuration, uh, system-wide synchronization. So I think that was pretty cool. So part of the testing that we did is we went in and we unplugged chassis and we started pulling wires and um, the system was fairly good, I would say, at, at uh, uh, withstanding that kind of disruption to the network. But over here, we still have single points of failure. Now, could you, with the same number of switches, wire it in a different way to where there are no single points of failure in the network? We still have a single computer, but in the network, could we wire it in such a way that you don't have a single, single point of failure? What if we took the leads of these rings here, instead of bringing them to the same switch, we straddled them to two different switches and we interleaved the switches um, going down the line? Something like this. Same exact hardware, we just wired it differently. Um, uh, and what, if you could kind of like, if you had your 3D glasses on, I mean, you could probably see, but this is kind of basically two network topologies stacked on top of each other. We tried this on the system that we have downstairs. We bought a second NIC and we wired it up like this. We had mixed success with this configuration. Um, I'm happy to report that you can still detect all of the hardware. We can still run a 2000 channel test with this, but if you come and pull one of these cables, you lose chassis. Chassis start throwing DACMX errors and they get removed to the test. So you basically lose uh, whatever benefit you were hoping to gain from the ring. Um, we also tried, uh, you know, because we had to set this up as a bridge over here. And so we we're like, well, maybe that's messing us up. And so we also added like an ag uh, a little aggregation stage here. Didn't really help. Um, so at the end of the day, we weren't able to get this configuration working, which is why we settled on, on this. This is as much uh, resiliency and redundancy as uh, we could figure out how to do on TSN. Yes, sir. When you said you removed, right, I understand unplugging the network cable. Yeah. You're saying you actually like removed 
a chassis, meaning. Well, I would take the power out of it. Okay. Yeah. So, so it, and everybody else still kept on. Everybody else kept running. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I thought it was good. Um, <clears throat> All right, so another constraint with TSN, which we have to account for, is the maximum number of hops. So if you look in, I think it's the 9189 spec sheet, it'll say a no node can have more than 15 hops from the root node. All right, so here's our 2048 channel system. It's downstairs. What are the maximum number of hops in this system from the root node? Any guesses? 10. 10, all right, good guess. Which one's the root node? You don't know. So with TSN, you don't have the ability, and the switches that we sell, 9805, you don't have the ability to set the root node, which means it could be any node, including any CDAC chassis in this system. So you have to design for worst case. So let's say worst case, this guy becomes your root node, all the way out here on the end of a ring. And this guy is gonna be the farthest device away from it. Let's count. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven hops away. All right, under the 15, 15 hop, hop limit, right? So we're good. So worst case, no matter what gets assigned as root node in this architecture, you're going to be within the spec. So in the design guide, uh, we do share uh, a table. In fact, you can you can make this a function of total number of nodes in your system. If you have 15 nodes in your system, you can put it all in one ring, no problem. But if you have more than 15 nodes in your system, you're gonna need to break it up into other rings. So if, uh, uh, oh yeah, so this is a 32 chassis system here. So 32 chassis means we can go seven nodes per ring. That's what you see in this, uh, in, in this implementation. But it was only 11 hops. Isn't there room to add more devices into these rings? Why not shove a few more in there? We've got room. Any thoughts? So remember the whole point of the ring was to try to like build in like uh, some resiliency to a ring breaking. So assume that this cable gets cut right here. Well now this ring of seven nodes now becomes a daisy chain of seven. So now if we're gonna look at worst case number of hops, we've gotta assume that this is, let's now say this is our root node. Now this is the furthest node from it. And we're gonna to have to start counting in this direction. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 hops. So this design accounts for disruption in the ring while still satisfying the 15 hop requirement. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so I mean, honestly, when we talk about like the architecture, the structural test architecture, really this, this TSN network topology is it. I mean, the other things in this are components. Like, uh, uh, the CDAC chassis are components, these 9805s are components. But really the way that this has been arranged is, is the essence of what we're calling the architecture, or at least what I call the architecture. All right, um, yes, yeah, so and that's what this diagram is intended to display. If we have a disruption in a, uh, a cable there, we've got to count the long way around to get our max hops. All right, um, how much time we got? Ten minutes, we're doing good. If you go on, and I, uh, I'm sorry, if you open up our package manager and search structural test, you will get this hit, the static test software suite. Um, if you download this, what you will get is a bunch of software. You'll get DACMX, FlexLogger, System Link, and a web application. Um, I'm not, it's criminal how little time I have to talk about this web application, but we did make a web application that is hosted on that server in the, in the server diagram. Um, and it's basically, you, you can open up a web browser, you can log in system link, you have your, your username, um, and you can, you will get this like view of all of the channels in the system as reported by FlexLogger, and you can select which channels are interesting to you. And then it will give you live updates in this table here of the current values of, those, of, the, of that data. You can create alarms against that data, you can enter comments here, uh, and that, those comments will show up in the FlexLogger log. It's pretty cool, kind of proud of it. Uh, but don't have a lot of time to talk about it. You can also like select a subset of the channels in here, hit graph, and it'll pop up another tab in your browser, and you can fill up all of your screens with all these nice time history displays of data that are that's interesting to you. And, uh, and then when you close all this and come back in, if you log right in, it's got all of these settings and preferences saved. Yes, sir. Does that keep up with the native uh, acquisition rate? The oh, good question. No, it doesn't. It updates once a second. Yeah, great question. 
Um, yeah, so if, uh, if the web application is interesting to you, it's available in the static uh, test software suite, and it uses System Link under the hood to connect uh, FlexLogger with everything. So we don't really use System Link here to like manage the nodes like, like is a typical use case of System Link. It, it is acting as our data server uh, using tags to, uh, to communicate data all over the system. So, uh, but if the web application is not interesting to you, you can deselect it here in the suite and all that gets installed is FlexLogger and uh, DACMX, which is similar to the, the FlexLogger uh, package that you would install. And it installs a certain set of, a version of those software. Uh, that's right, yeah, so that's a good point. So um, the versions that get installed are specifically the versions that we have tested with. So uh, I'm trying to get away from like, you can have any permutation of software that, that, that you want. It can be difficult to, to, to support sometimes. This is the software stack that we use to validate the test system that's downstairs. And we do periodically, my team does periodically revalidate this stack um, uh, and, and release a new version of this suite installer. All right, validating the architecture. So, like I said, we did build this system. Uh, here it is, it's also downstairs. And we had this thing built and we ran it and we beat the hell out of it for quite a while. There was a variety of tests that we ran. We tried to answer the questions. How many channels can we run? How long can we run for and how fast can we go? Uh, and that's basically the tests were focused on those three questions. So we did run a two week continuous test at 100 Hertz with the system downstairs. Um, I'm happy to report that it ran for two weeks uninterrupted and we got a whole lot of data <laughs> out of that test system over those two weeks. Um, we also looked at resource utilization. Um, we share the computer specs that we used in the system downstairs in the, uh, in the design guide. Um, but over the two weeks, we had about 50% CPU utilization, 25% memory utilization. And I hear FlexLogger has even made improvements to this uh, since, since the test that we've run. Um, we also did some parameterized testing, so we could strategically pull some cables and get basically a five, oh, basically get a 500 channel system, a thousand channel system, a 2,000 channel system that still adhered to the pattern. And uh, we just tried to see how fast can we run the system. Um, happy to report that we maxed out the uh, the maximum sample rate of the modules were 10k, so that was the bottleneck at 500 channels. It was also the bottleneck at 1,100 channels. Once we got up to 2,000 channels, we had to throttle down the sample rate to about 3,000 samples a second. And these tests uh, ran continuously for an hour. So we're like, after an hour, we felt, felt pretty good about that. And then finally, um, Flex is a feature of flex loggers. You can do mass shunt offset null and shunt calibration operations. And so we're just curious, how long does it take to do shunt calibration uh, of 2,000 channels? Well, 1,944 of the 2,048 channels. And it's about five minutes for each of those operations, shunt cal and offset null. All right, finally, let's talk about project deliverables. So there are three documents on ni.com that, um, that, uh, that we delivered as a result of this project. One is called the system design guide or designing systems using the architecture. Another one's called commissioning a system with the from the architecture. And the last one is benchmarking a system from the architecture. Um, and basically the design guide is, uh, it goes into the detail about the pattern that we're talking about here. And it has a 12 step process for how you would design a system using this pattern. Step one, map your sensors to, uh, to hardware channels uh, on the list of modules that we've tested with. Step two, group those into groups. Step three, insert them into chassis. Step four, assign your rings. Step five, tune the rings based on the number of hops. So it goes through like a 12 step process. We can probably automate this with a tool someday where you just insert your channel list and it, out, it pops out a bomb and a, and a schematic of your system. Uh, right now it's manual and that manual process is outlined and documented there in the system design guide. The commissioning guide is an aggregate of all the product level documentation that's relevant to this architecture. So how do you mount your chassis? How do you install the firmware? How do you configure your system link? How do you configure your web server? Um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, how do you ground the system? Like we pulled all the product documentation that we felt was relevant to manufacturing one of these systems and we aggregated it into this commissioning document. And then finally, we have the benchmarking document which talks in more detail with the tests that we ran and we published the results of those tests in that document as well. So the idea is that uh, you start with the system design guide, you bring your own channel count and channel composition to the design guide, walk through the 12-step process, and out pops a system schematic and bomb. You can go and buy all this hardware. When the hardware shows up, um, you then use the commissioning guide to assemble your system. Everything you would need to build it, which then will turn into a concrete test system, and the system benchmark guide will give you an idea of what kind of performance you can expect out of it. The software that we used 
to perform all of this benchmark became the validated in version software installer that you have in Package Manager today. And so everything delivered out of this project is right here on this slide. The design guide, the commissioning guide, the benchmark guide, and the software suite. Um, the idea here is we wanted to like facilitate system level business at all stages of the system lifecycle, from design all the way through validating a, a, a build. So uh, as far as lessons learned go, we've already talked about some of them. I think the hardest part about this project, honestly, is the very first thing. Is you need a good set of common industry requirements. Uh, not, too, not too specific, so that only one or two customers can benefit from it, um, but not also overly general to where you don't have anything that's useful. I think this is the hardest part here. Uh, so uh, um, this is a really hard thing to make. <laughs> uh, and I'll leave it up to you to decide if we did any good, if we did any good job at it or not. But um, this is definitely something you've got to have when you take an, make an undertaking like this. Finally, the, uh, the model, model-based systems engineering thing, like I said, the methodology uh, for how to decompose the system was extremely valuable to us. It brought a lot of chaos into the, into the, to the, the uh, sorry, it brought a lot of uh, structure into the chaos. And I'm really glad we ran across that. We were really disciplined early about making our model, but when we transitioned to execution, it became very difficult to keep our model uh, uh, fresh. Because Cameo, because really ultimately I need two things that, that I need to track my requirements against. I need to track my design against my requirements, right? So if requirements change, I need to change my design. If there's anything in my design that doesn't satisfy a requirement, I need to cut it out. I need a tight like tracking between my requirements and my design. I also need tight tracking between my requirements and the work that's happening on my engineering team. So if one of my engineers is like implementing something that we can't trace to a requirement, he or she should stop. <laughs> if we have requirements that we don't have any work planned for, we need to go and look at that. I need tight tracking between the requirements and work we're doing. Cameo's great. I'll say Cameo's good. Cameo's good at tracking my design against my requirements. We use Azure DevOps to track like all the work items on our team. Uh, and they don't integrate well to one another. And so I tried keeping these things in sync for a while, but I, it, I, I did not in the long term. Uh, because uh, we were in execution mode, this really became our primary source of truth. We didn't have a single source of truth. And so, I don't know, I struggled to like navigate this and I'd be interested to hear any ideas you guys might have and how I could do this better in the future. Um, the other thing, uh, SysML is a, uh, it was an imperfect language for this project. It was uh, good at, at describing most of the things, like the workflows, it was great at describing that. But like that part where I showed you like the ring aggregation pattern, SysML, uh, SysML would call that something called variant modeling and it doesn't have any native support for variant modeling. And I know that's something they're attacking with 2.0, um, but that's a critical part of our project and there's no native support in SysML for that kind of modeling. Um, so we struggled to model that part in SysML. Um, uh, we talked about, uh, oops, we talked about TSN. Uh, don't straddle switches. Uh, you've got to keep your ring to a single switch. And, uh, and also as a lesson learned, this is uh, flex logger is no longer your grandma's flex logger. Uh, <laughs> it can handle 2000 channels of acquisition. Uh, I was pretty, uh, pretty impressed by the amount of work that our engineering team put into flex logger to handle a test of this size. So that's it. Almost too easy, right? Thank you for coming. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, We've got FlexLogger team here. We've got our offering manager for structural test here. Me and my team are here. We're happy to field any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you.